Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Nailed to the cross, convicted as a criminal with no justice, Jesus cries out to the Father, and this is a tender and intimate moment that gives us just a hint of the close relationship between Jesus and his heavenly Father. Jesus doesn't ask for deliverance, nor retribution for those who are mocking him. In keeping with the heart and the nature of his Father, his first words on the cross are about forgiveness. Jesus had spent much of his earthly ministry teaching about forgiveness. Now he is going to demonstrate ultimate and perfect forgiveness as he hangs on the cross for the sins of all of humanity. His words are priestly, just as the priests in the Old Testament would offer up a sacrifice for atonement so that the people could be forgiven. Now Jesus is acting as both great high priest and spotless sacrifice as he offers up himself to cleanse us once and for all from our sins. And he's requesting that the Father forgive us. With this cry, Father, forgive them. Jesus fulfills his purpose. He came to save us. And our salvation, our forgiveness comes through his sacrifice. He looks through the Roman soldiers that were gambling for his clothes. And he looks through the religious leaders and their followers that were mocking him. He looks through all of our pretenses and our attitudes, and he sums up their motives and ours as he declares to the Father, they don't know what they're doing. And from the cross, Jesus saw me, and he saw you, and as our great high priest and perfect sacrifice, Jesus extends that same intercession for me and you. These are simple words, but words that have changed my life. And if you would receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, they, they will, will change, change your, your life, life too. too. Luke 23, 43. Today, you will be with me in paradise. There were three men on crosses that day. All three of them were close to death. All three of them were in pain. All three of them were suspended between heaven and earth. Between two sinners, both tried and convicted and deserving of their punishment, hung the sinless Son of God. One man, without reason, hurled insults and curses at the very one who could save him, demanding that Jesus prove his deity by first saving himself. He did not understand that Jesus could have, at any moment, called upon his Father to end his pain and humiliation. But if he did that, then he would not have been able to save the very ones he came for. The other man, in an equal amount of pain, cried out as well, but his cries were different. This man cried out for salvation. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Above the head of Jesus hung three signs, one in Greek, one in Latin, and one in Hebrew. Each of them declaring Jesus to be the King of the Jews. This man had probably seen the signs, and in some deep truth resonated in his heart that Jesus was indeed King. This man, this convicted criminal, 
He had done nothing right for a very long time. He had no spiritual brownie points stored up somewhere. He had done nothing, had become nothing that was deserving of salvation. And yet, he makes his humble and sincere plea as he dies next to the Son of God. All three men are on the cross and dying for sin that day. One is dying in his sin, one is dying for his sin, and one is dying because of sin. One man died in his sin, his opportunity of salvation discarded like a useless piece of merchandise. One man died for his sin, but his eternal destination was changed because of one humble cry to Jesus. One man died because of the sins of humanity so that all of us could make a humble cry and be with him in eternity. John 19, 26 through 27. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. Mary had lived through so much as a pregnant and unwed teenager. She'd endured the hateful and critical stares of the religious and the self-important folk. And she had survived. She was present for his first cry, his first step, his first word, his first miracle. She was there when he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem with everyone shouting, Hosanna to the King. She was there when he was arrested and when the same crowds that had been declaring him king were now shouting, crucify him. When all his disciples, except for John, scattered in fear, she was there. She was there when he was beaten and crucified. She was there. She was there and she remained at his side as he hung on the cross dying. Jesus gives us a glimpse into the love that he has for this woman. His first two words from the cross were deeply, deeply spiritual. Forgive them, and today you will be with me in paradise. His third word is, is human, it's, it's practical. He wants his mother to be cared for. He tasks John, the beloved, with the responsibility of being a son to her. Even in his excruciating pain, even in the agony that he's enduring on the cross, he sees the pain and need of his mother, and he offers her the comfort of a son. I wonder if Jesus was thinking of our emotional pain and our aloneness when he said that he would not leave us alone either. But after his resurrection and ascension, he would send the Holy Spirit to be a teacher and a comforter for us. Jesus didn't leave Mary alone. And the good news is, he does not leave us alone either. He did not forsake his mother in her pain and, and her confusion. And, and he, he will, will not, not forsake, forsake us, us either. either. Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Every recorded prayer of Jesus in the gospel began with Father, except this one. He had endured the pain of crucifixion, the humiliation of being stripped naked and put in public display, the mocking and abusive comments, all of this without whimper. Until now, for the first time since even before the beginning, the Son is separated from his Father. Jesus did not die as a martyr for a righteous cause, or simply as an innocent man wrongly accused and condemned. He did not die as a heroic act against man's inhumanity to man. The Father would have looked favorably in such an act of love and selflessness. Jesus was on that cross as the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And a holy God 
would have judged him fully according to that sin. The father turned away from the son as he hung on that cross because Jesus took upon himself our transgression, our iniquities. The holy and spotless Son of God willingly, intentionally took upon himself the sins of this world, and his Father turned away from him. Rejection, abandonment, an indescribable pain from the depths of its being forced its way to the surface in its cry taken directly from Psalm 22. With all the sin of the world, all the sin, the sins of me and you, and the most vile offense imaginable, all laid upon him. And the wrath of the Father towards such willful offense poured out on Jesus in full force. He who knew no sin became sin in that moment, and the Father had to look away from him. For just a moment, a moment that must have felt like an eternity to both the Father and His Son. They were separated because of sin. It was love that held them to the cross for that moment. A love that goes beyond our human comprehension, that would have allowed the Son to pay such a high price for our salvation. It was a faith that I cannot understand that allowed Jesus to take my place that day, allowing, allowing the, fa the Father to turn, to turn away, away from, from him so, so that, that he could turn toward towards me and you. In John 19, 28, Jesus declared, I test. I test is such a simple and even common thing to say. Test is a part of our humanity our human conditions. Jesus was no stranger to the importance of water for our well-being. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus has spoken quite a bit of our test. He had told the woman at the well that he could give to her water to drink, and she would never taste again. He had also declared that out of innermost being would flow wells or rivers of the living water. So how could the source of that living water, the one who has provided this drink for so many, now declare that is test? There are three dynamic reasons for Jesus making these declarations. Let's look at the first one. His test makes us aware of his real and physical nature. In full humanity, Jesus, the creator and sustainer of all that is, suffers as a man. There can be no doubt the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now on the cross, the pain and anguish is real. And his tests is fully God and full man. What an in incomprehensible mystery. The second reason is connected to the saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His taste is not only physical, it's also spiritual. He's separated from his father and the spiritual impactness. He is experiencing is worse than any, any physical test we could ever know. When we are separated, from the Father because of sin and indifference. We experience a spiritual test. If we refuse to satisfy the God-given test with salvation and the right relationship with the Father, we will try and quench it with sinful, worldly things. From the cross, Jesus cried out, I test to remind us that if we are trying to satisfy our spiritual longing with something or someone other than him, who will remain dry and parched. The third reason Jesus made this cry is given to us in the Bible itself. 
in order that scripture might be fulfilled. In Psalm 22, 15, this agonizing test is prophetically declared, my strength is dried up like a post held, and my tongues stick to the roof of my mouth. In Psalm 6, 9, 21, they put guilt and food and gave me vineyard for my test. Even in this physical and spiritual anguish, Jesus, Jesus will, fully will fully complete, complete everything, everything that, is that is before, before him, him so that he can make his next triumphant statement. John 19, 30, it is finished. Just three little words in the English and one word in the Greek, tetelestai, it has been finished. This is a passionate declaration of a difficult and complicated process that is now completed to everyone's satisfaction. When considering this particular scripture, Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, described it as an ocean of meaning in a drop of language. It is finished is a phrase that we would use when we finish a course of study and receive a degree when we pay off the mortgage on our home or the title to our car. It would be uttered when you reach a particularly difficult and challenging goal. This phrase indicates the successful end to a particular course of action. And it means so much more than just, whew, I survived, I'm done. It means I did exactly what I set out to do and I did it well. This word is often translated paid in full and it was used as an accounting term. The Greek tense of this word indicates that it was finished in the past, it is still finished in the present, and it will remain finished into the future. It is paid in full. And oh, by the way, the price of our salvation is paid in full for all time. If I had been there on that day, what would I have seen? What would I have heard? Would I have seen a badly beaten, bloody, and bruised man half out of his mind with pain? When I heard him say, it is finished, would I have understood him to be saying that he was finished? Indicating that he was giving up or that he had done all that he could do? No, no we, we know that not to be the case. He was not giving up nor giving out. It was finished. The work that his father had sent him to do, the salvation price for all of humanity, had been paid in full. Jesus spoke these words out loud for everyone to hear. His Father in heaven would hear and accept the sacrifice of the Son on behalf of humanity. Every evil force would hear and loosen their grip on the souls of men and women. The religious system, they would also hear. And the veil that had been separating man from God would rip in two and we would be invited into the Holy of Holies. The dead, yep, they heard, and they would burst forth from their graves. The realm of nature would also hear, and the ground would quake and shake, and the skies would grow dark because the sun refused to shine. And I would hear and confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It, it is, is finished. finished. And, and I, am, I his. am his. Luke 23, 46. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. From the cross, Jesus has demonstrated perfect forgiveness when he cried out, Father, forgive them. He's shown us compassion when he said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He showed us responsibility and love when he said, behold, your mother. We saw his emotional pain when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken us? We saw his human suffering when he said, I thirst. And then that ultimate declaration of victory when he said, it is finished. And now he shows us trust when he says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. In Luke 2.49, we have the first recorded words of Jesus when he says to his parents, did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? 
His entire life and ministry had been lived out in complete obedience to His Father. From the very beginning, there's this intimacy between the Father and the Son that defines itself with complete and absolute trust. This passage, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, this passage records his last words before he dies. There's a sense of rest and resolve in this declaration. He's not quitting. He is not leaving work undone. This is the declaration of one who has completed the task he came to do. He has done it all. Just think about it. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He showed us the Father, His life, His words and actions. They all demonstrated what we should and what we could be. He offered Himself on the cross so that we could become the sons and the daughters of God. Indeed, He has done it all, and there's no longer a reason for Him to remain. It's time to go. Using the words of David in Psalm 31, 5, Jesus trusts the Father to be His protector. He can commit His Spirit to the Father, for the Father will deliver Him from the grave. In Acts 7.49 and in 1 Peter 4, Stephen and Peter both indicate that they've entrusted their spirit to the Father. We can entrust our souls to a faithful Creator. He really does have us in the palm of His hand. In life and in death, we can trust Him. Luke is careful to record that Jesus uttered these words, these final words, with a loud voice. He didn't have to shout for his father to hear him. I think that he said these words with a loud voice because he wanted us to hear. He wanted us to understand that when it's time for us to go, the same God that we've trusted and followed in life, he's gonna lead us home. In the words of the contemporary psalm, no guilt in life, no fear, no fear in, in death. death. This, this is, is the, the power, power of Christ, Christ in me. From life's From first, first cry, cry to, to final breath, breath Jesus, Jesus commands my destiny. destiny. No, no power, power of hell, of hell no, no scheme of, of man, man can never ever pluck me, me from, his hand. from his hand. Till he, Til he returns, returns or, or calls, calls me home. Me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand.